Welcome. We are going to look at applications of the compactness theorem. In particular, we, we will look at how it can be used to, to show the expressive limitations of first-order logic. So our motivating question here is what can and what cannot be expressed in first-order logic. Because now what do I mean by being expressed? Well, a theory is supposed to express a property of structures. So for example, the theory of linear orders is supposed to express the property of being a linearly ordered structure. And this in the sense that, that the models of uh, the theory of linear orders are supposed to be exactly the linearly ordered structures. So it's all very logical. So that the theory T expresses a property P, to make this into definition, what I mean is that every uh, for every model, uh, it models T if and only if it has the property P. Many properties of structure actually cannot be expressed by any theory in first order logic. So we will see how this comes out. What the compactness theorem boils down to is really the finite character of logic. And the basic observation here is that proofs are necessarily finite. So a proof can only contain finitely many axioms. Um, in particular, if, if T is the theory that proves a sentence sigma, then there must be a finite sub-theory uh, that proves uh, sigma, because the proof could only have used finitely many axioms, so just take them those finitely many axioms to be f. Now, a very important application of this is that uh, if every finite sub-theory is consistent, then uh, the whole theory is consistent. And the way to see this now is that, well, uh, to be consistent, what that means is that there is no uh, proof of a contradiction. So if there were a proof of a contradiction from t, well, then there must be a finite sub-theory. Uh, where, the, where there's also proof of a contradiction. The compactness theorem is really the semantic side of this. So it reads as follows, that if every finite sub-theory has a model, then the whole theory has a model. And uh, if we have already proved the completeness theorem, then it is very easy to simply apply that to get the compactness theorem. And I think it also reveals the very close connection here between the semantic and the syntactic side. So let us uh, use that strategy here. And uh, so, okay, our assumption here is that every finite sub-theory has a model. Well, then by soundness, which is one direction of completeness, every finite sub-theory must be consistent. And by the syntactic argument above, we saw that if every finite sub-theory is consistent, then the whole theory is consistent. So we can conclude that the whole T is consistent. And now by completeness, since T is consistent, T has a model, and we have proved compactness. So let's now look at properties and models that can be expressed by a theory. And recall again what I mean by being expressed by a theory. It means that for every structure, M, M models T if and only if M has the property P. That's what, what it means to say that T expresses the property P. So the first example is the property of containing exactly two things. This property is expressed by a theory consisting of this one single sentence, uh, as I have written here. So please pause uh, and take a look at this and uh, verify for yourself that if M is a model of uh, this theory, then uh, it must have exactly two things, and also conversely that if M is a model which contains exactly two things, well then it also satisfies this sentence. As a second example, we will look at being infinite. This can also be expressed by theory, and um, to see this, well, first, let us uh, convince ourselves that sentences of the form there are at least n different things for some natural number can be expressed in the formal language. So here I've given the example of uh, there are at least three different things. 
And so again, please pause, consider this, and uh, convince yourself that for every natural number m, there is such a sentence in the formal language. Now that we know that those sentences exist, well, uh, we simply take the theory uh, t to be uh, all of those, the set of all of those sentences. So t is saying that there are at least two different things, or at least three different things, or at least four different things, or at least five different things, and so on for every natural number. So if uh, m is a model of t, then it must have infinitely many things. And also if m is just some infinite structure, uh, then it's also clear that it will satisfy this uh, theory t. So, so we have shown that t expresses the property of being infinite. Now, the, uh, the opposite property, that of being finite, uh, turns out cannot be expressed by a theory in first order logic. And uh, to say this precisely, uh, we have here a theorem which says that uh, if we're given any theory t, and if for every natural number there is a model of this theory which has at least n elements, then uh, the theory must actually have an infinite model. So this means that t, no theory t can actually express the notion of finiteness, because if if, if t expresses the notion of finiteness, well then every structure that has, that for every natural number n, any structure uh, which has uh, exactly n elements must be a model of t. But this theorem says that, well, if t has all of those structures as models, then it actually also has to have an infinite model. So t can not distinguish between the finite and the infinite, in this sense. So how do we prove this? Well, the idea is that we extend this arbitrary theory T with uh, the theory that we used in the previous example, uh, which expresses that there are infinitely many things. So then we obtain this theory T prime. So think of it as just t plus the expression that there are infinitely many things. Now, we're going to show that t prime has a model. Because if t prime has a model, then that model must be infinite. But since t prime includes t, it must also be a model of t. And so we will have shown the theorem. So, uh, our strategy is here to apply the compactness theorem. And the compactness theorem says that, well, it is sufficient that we just show that every finite subtheory has a model. But if we look at some finite subtheory f prime or t prime, we can notice that only finitely many of these sentences, there are at least n different things, appear in f prime. So, for some of these natural numbers, must be the largest one that appears in f prime. That's called that number m. Now, if we, we so the, the assumption of the theorem was that well, for every natural number, t has a model with at least uh, that many elements. So simply apply that to this natural number m. Uh, then we get this uh, model uh, of f prime. So again, please pause and uh, convince yourself that we do actually get this model of f prime from the assumption of the theorem. Well, now that we have done that, since this uh, was doable for any finite subtheory, it must be by compactness theorem that t prime, the whole of t prime, has a model m. And so. Since it's a model of t prime, it uh, it must be an infinite model, but uh, t prime also includes t as a subtheory, so m must actually be a model of t. So we have shown that t prime t that the t has an infinite model, and uh, we only use the assumption that uh, for every natural number, t has a model with at least that many elements.
Now, uh, I would like to give just a more philosophically motivated claim here that can also be proved with uh, the compactness theorem. So my sort of informal claim here is that no theory can express that everything has a name. So what do I mean by has a name here? Well, I mean a name in a uh, in a quite a wide uh, sense, uh, namely that uh, the terms of our formal language. That that's what I mean by names. These are the things that actually the, the syntactic objects that actually refer to. Uh, to semantic objects. So they are very much like names, but uh, we of course allow here uh, names with arbitrary complexity. But uh, even if we allow names with arbitrary complexity, I'm going to show that any theory has a model which has an object which is not equal to any such name. The formal statement then is that, uh, well, if a theory T has an infinite model M, then T has a model M with an element A such that N satisfies that tau is not equal to A for each term tau in the language. I will not go through the proof in detail. Uh, please uh, pause and read it yourself. I will just explain the, the main uh, idea here, uh, which is uh, an important technique which is used very often in uh, combination with compactness. So what we do is that we extend the language with a new constant, in this case I call it alpha, and then we extend the theory t to the theory t prime, uh, which uh, also has uh, sentences which are mentioning alpha, and in this case the t prime is constructed so that it's saying that this alpha is different from all of the all of the terms. Then we will use compactness to show that t prime has a model, and then we will uh, revert back to the original language and see that uh, we actually obtain a model where um, which which has an element not referred to by any of the terms of the language. And to conclude, here are three exercises on uh, using compactness. In these exercises, we start from the theory of linear orders. And um, you will be uh, showing that uh, some uh, extensions of, of this theory have uh, models. And you will be uh, doing this both in a constructive way, which does not uh, use the compactness theorem, and then you will also uh, show the show the existence of models using the compactness theorem. But then, in the end, uh, it will turn out that only the technique using the compactness theorem will work for uh, this very complex theory called Peano arithmetic. And. Um, uh, but w once we uh, apply compactness and, and, and prove this property for piano arithmetic, uh, the conclusion will actually be that uh, piano arithmetic does not rule out the existence of infinite natural numbers. And this is a very uh, important classical uh, case of the expressive limitations of first-order logic. Uh, 